Hi, everyone. We're going to give it a few more minutes to get some more people uh, hopefully joining in, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining today. Hi, everyone. If you didn't hear already, we're going to start in about a minute or so just to let a, a, to let uh, some late joiners uh, get a chance to uh, join in, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started here. The participants have slowed down entering the room, so we'll go ahead and get going. Uh, welcome everyone. This is the September meeting for the San Diego County Air Pollution Control District Warehouse Working Group, or as we call it, the WWG. Uh, next slide, please. So before we uh, get started today, we just have, a, again, some a few meeting announcements. Uh, everyone except the presenter will be muted unless called upon by the host. Uh, we'd ask that you save your questions and comments until the end of the uh, of each section that we'll be presenting. Um, and then finally, we'll be recording and posting the recording on the district's YouTube page uh, following the meeting. We also typically post a one-page summary of what was covered during those meetings. Uh, during each meeting. So um, feel free to take a look at that. All of that is posted on the Warehouse Working Group uh, webpage of the SDA PCD website. Uh, next slide, please. So this is going to be an overview of what we're going to be covering in today's presentation. Uh, we're going to be taking attendance and introductions, uh, doing introductions of district staff and meeting participants of who's here today. Uh, we'll then do a quick recap of the last meeting that was uh, held in June. The uh, July and August meetings were canceled. Uh, we'll present uh, some information about SANDAG's 2022 commercial vehicle survey and how it relates to the district's analysis. We'll then provide an update on the South Coast Air Quality Management District uh, WARE program, which is the implementation of the uh, Warehouse Rule 2305 in their region. Uh, we'll then cover, uh, we'll then go over comparison of Caltrans truck counts in comparison, in comparison to SANDAG model data. And then we'll briefly cover uh, two suggested data sets that may assist with the district's future analysis that we'll be um, looking at in the future. And then time permitting, we'll have uh, a little bit of time for any non-agenda items or any other comments from participants. Um, is everyone okay with that agenda? I did want to perhaps maybe, I see um, uh, Ian in the room from South Coast. I don't, I know you had a conflict today. Would it be of interest, Ian, if we covered the South Coast item before the Sandag item in, in case there's a, any feedback or any questions on your end or do you, do you mind either way? Uh, I'm fine, whatever the group wants to do. Okay. I think, we're, well, we'll probably go ahead and stick with it. If you're fine with it, then, um, you know, and like we said, we, if there's any questions, if you have to, uh, if you have to leave, that's fine. We can forward any questions after the fact too, so. 
Uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and stick with the agenda as written here, and then we'll uh, connect with you if we need to. Um, okay, next slide, please. So um, we're going to spend a few minutes just to um, do some brief introductions. Uh, just in the interest of time, I like to go through the list that's in Zoom. And um, if you could um, make sure that your name in Zoom includes your affiliation or who you re represent, that would help us track who's here and who's uh, participating. Um, and if I don't see it on Zoom, I may ask that um, you identify where you're from uh, in terms of your organization that you represent. So uh, first, my name is Nick Cormier. I'm the Rural Development Supervisor here at the district. Um, I'm just going to go through the names that I see them on the list for district and others. So I see Janet McHugh here. She's helping us behind the scenes with all things IT uh, and keeping us on track. I see Kathy Keehan, who's our chief of the Mission Reduction Strategy Group here at APCD. Uh, Aaron Isherwood, or Isherwood. Uh, Aaron, would you mind um, unmuting and identifying your uh, organization that you're a part of, if any? Hi, it's Aaron Isherwood, and I'm with the National Sierra Club. Great, thank you. Um, I see Andrew Aguilar from Industrial, uh, uh, I'm sorry, IEA. Um, I see uh, Ariel, Ariel Fiddledy from CARB. Uh, Avi Lavi, hopefully I pronounced that right. Uh, Avi, could you um, please identify the organization that you're uh, part of? Yes, I'm from South Coast. Thank you. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Um, I see Charles Rilly from uh, Sierra Club. Craig Benedetto from NAOP. I see Ian McMillan from South Coast Air Quality Management District. Uh, Jessica Klobas from Sonoma Tech. Lauren Cazares from San Diego Regional Chamber of Commerce. Oh, sorry, my screen went crazy there. Uh, Mackenzie Lynch from Prologis. Hopefully I pronounced that right. Uh, Massey Hatch from IEA. And MS, MS Hatch Consulting. Sorry, it's jumping around to me quite a bit here. Uh, Matt. Traino from IDS Real Estate, Michelle Jerome from Port of San Diego, uh, Mike Watt, who is our Deputy Director here at APCD, Nicholas Paul from Environmental Health Coalition, uh, Randy Constellation, who you'll hear from in a second here, uh, from an Air Pollution Control District, uh, Regina Sue from Earth Justice, Rod Johnson. Rod, would you mind uh, identifying uh, your organization, if you're part of one. All right, no worries. Connect up with Rod later. Uh, Cheryl Vaughn. Cheryl, do you, do you have an organization you're a part of? All right. Uh, Sterling Ross. Sterling, I, I believe you're with SDG&E, correct? worries. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Uh, <laughs> we got TM Novin from GSI Environmental, Tim Garrett from Sandag, uh, Tim Pohl. Uh, uh, Tim, would you mind identifying your organization if you can hear me? Sure. Are you able to hear me? I can hear you. Yes. All right. I'm a lawyer with Beverage and Diamond in Washington, D.C. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And then I see Victor Mendiola. Uh, Victor, I believe you're with CARB, correct? Hey, good afternoon. That is correct. Uh, I am with the South Coast Planning Group. Great. Thank you for joining. Thank you. And um, I see Zach Friedlander from TRC Company. I think that's what it says. Yes, TRC Companies. Um, is there um, anybody that I missed going through the list in terms of who's here? today. Okay. Well, with that, thank you for um, just going through that and making the introductions. And now we'll go ahead and get into the bulk of our slides today. 
So um, the following is just a recap of what was covered in our last meeting held in June. Like I said, the um, July and August meetings were canceled, um, each for different reasons, unfortunately. So we weren't able to, to, to uh, meet in those months, but we are back on track now uh, meeting today. And so um, this is just a recap of what we covered in June as a refresher. The meeting focused on the district's truck trip rate analysis. Um, some comments that we received at the last meeting included uh, that Sandex staff recommended that no further use of the Series 14 ABM 2 Plus modeling data, which had a 2016 base year that was used in the district's truck trip rate analysis that we went through um, at, the, at the June meeting. Um, so we do wanted to note here that it's important to note that Sandag's recommendation was with respect to using the data for the that specific data for the purposes of rulemaking. Um, however, the district does intend to use the data to help evaluate if a rulemaking or regulatory or non-regulatory approach should proceed. Um, so we wanted to, we just wanted to make sure that was clear and made that distinction here today. Um, Another comment we received was that the estimated truck trip rates should be verified with actual data that can be attained by conducting a traffic study or a survey of warehouse operators. We also heard that an analysis for smaller vehicles with gross vehicle weight rating of less than 8,500 pounds should be considered as a potential alternative to an ISR if one is adopted. And then finally, the community resident that community residents regularly voice their concerns about the heavy duty truck traffic from warehouses in their neighborhood. So um, were there any questions or concerns um, stemming from that uh, summary or the June meeting that we wanted to bring up before jumping into our first item today? Okay, well, I think we'll go ahead and get started and jump into our first presentation today. Um, and that will be on Sandag's commercial vehicle survey. So this is something that we identified a few months ago um, as part of our um, work and in, in working behind the scenes here at the district and, in the, and looking at different warehouse related issues. Um, and so this 2022 Sandag commercial, commercial Vehicle Survey, um, it began in the spring of 2022 and ran through January 2023. And the ETC Institute and a consultant named RSG worked with Sandag to conduct a, a multi-step commercial vehicle survey or, or what we call a CVS in San Diego County. The CVS consisted of three main parts. Uh, first, the, it was an establishment survey that was designed to understand the number and types of commercial vehicles that are operated by a diverse sample of business establishments in the region. Uh, the second component was a passive GPS travel diary that collected GPS data for the trips made by a subset of the vehicles operated by establishment survey participants. Um, for further clarity on that, the travel diary was primarily administered by uh, two drivers using a mobile app that, and that enabled efficient and accurate collection of vehicle movements while significantly reducing the survey response burden. Uh, so it's all kind of automatically done. Third, uh, the third component was a GPS travel diary of transportation network company drivers in the region or TNCs. Um, so in contrast to like traditional commercial vehicles, TNC typically offer an on-demand business to consumers uh, in terms of their delivery services, and they're all pre-arranged over an online app. So, you know, these are like Ubers, Lyfts, that sort of thing. Uh, because this group represents a special population distinct from regular commercial vehicle traffic, it presented, it was presented separately in the report from traditional commercial vehicles. Uh, the, com the comprehensive approach to data collection for the commercial vehicle survey, it generated a, a significant volume of valuable information about commercial vehicle and TNC travel uh, travel patterns. And my lights just went out in my room. Uh, so this in turn provided uh, an in-depth understanding of travel behavior in the San Diego region, which will be really critical for future transportation planning and policymaking decisions. And in particular, for what the regional plans uh, for what the region plans to do about warehouses, um, utilizing localized data 
that is also built into SANDAG's regional transportation planning um, is really attractive to us and, and, and it, it presents a really good um, cohesive approach to, to moving forward on this. So um, if you're curious about the full report, it can be accessed using the link on the slide. And we can certainly put that in the chat as well. If, if someone on our team might be able to do that, that would be great. Uh, next slide, please. So for I, the APCD and the warehouse working group, some of the most int interesting data um, is around the average number of trucks in the region, the length of their trips, and the information about what types of industries most trips begin and end with. So this slide shows a summary of some of that key information about the trips and tours sampled in the commercial vehicle survey and the transportation network company uh, survey samples. Um, if you're curious, this is table one in the report itself. Um, so for purposes of clarity, a tour it references to a sequence of trips made by a vehicle and a driver uh, within a 24 hour survey period. Uh, tours, they typically include multiple stops or activities while, compete, while completing each trip with the larger tour. Um, so next slide, please. So this slide is from table 11 in the report, and it shows the average number of vehicles the, by vehicle type and by industry group. Um, so on average, the industrial and utility establishments have the largest fleets of light duty commercial vehicles or, or LCVs is what they call them in the table that you can see in the, uh, in the uh, black column there. Um, and that, that has approximately seven vehicles um, per establishment. That's the average fleet size um, for that particular truck uh, vehicle category. Transportation establishments um, reported having the largest fleets of multi-unit uh, trucks. So that's the MUT column um, that you see on the far right side. So that again is um, a high, there's a high number of vehicles coming from the transportation group. Next slide, please. So then moving on to table 13 in the CVS, this one shows that the average number of daily deliveries received by establishments within each industry group. And then they further categorize it by origin type. Um, so as you're looking at this table, it's a little difficult to kind of get your bearings around it. So I might stay on this slide for a second, but um, excluding the other category, which you'll see is kind of the second to last column there, uh, in black, um, then you can the other than that category, uh, warehouses emerge as the primary source of shipment origins, and warehouses is in that first column in black. Um, so you can see the uh, number at the bottom. That's one point two. That's the uh, average of approximately one point two vehicles per establishment per day. Uh, in terms of deliveries to a to a warehouse in the San Diego region. Um, so that's kind of the, that's kind of how to read it. There's other categories on there as far as, you know, are, the, are these vehicles going to ports and airport terminals, manufacturing, retail outlets, service business. Uh, and then there's kind of a, a, a catch-all category, which is the other category. Um, so just, Want to make sure, and then so that's broken down by industry group too, in terms of who's what kind of deliveries are being made. Is that an agriculturing, agricultural, or a mining industry group? Um, you know, there, there's a lot of different ways you can slice and dice the data. Uh, on average, warehouses account for about of a third of the total deliveries by origin, and that outweighs almost all other shipment origin categories. And again, this is San Diego specific uh, data according to this commercial vehicle survey report. Next slide, please. Oh, I see uh, Andrew. Andrew, did you have a question about the data or? No, wanna... but just uh, just put me put me first on the on the comment period if you don't mind. Sure, no problem. Okay. Um, 
So moving on, we're now on slide uh, 10, I believe. Uh, so this is a uh, figure 11 in the commercial vehicle survey. And this one shows how vehicles contained in the sample are primarily used. So for example, for cargo delivery, commercial service, or, for, or both in some cases. Uh, and this, it shows it for each of the eight vehicle classifications. So it ranges from automobiles to tractor trailer combinations. Uh, so among the light duty, among the lightest vehicles, so those are your passenger vehicles, your autos, your pickup trucks, um, and then buses and some vans, uh, most vehicles are being used for commercial services. Uh, and then almost all of the heavy duty trucks in, in this particular table, the tractor trailer combinations are used for cargo delivery only. And that's how you see the red bar that's pretty far to the right there. That indicates they're pretty much being used primarily for for, car for uh, cargo delivery, which makes sense. Uh, that is kind of what we would expect to see for, you know, heavy duty trucks that are, um, that's pretty much what they do. Uh, next slide, please. And then finally, this slide shows the average distance traveled per trip for various vehicle classes. And then this is from table 17 from the commercial vehicle survey report, um, if, if you're curious in taking a look at it. And what this information allows us to know is how far each vehicle class is going and how long it's going to, and how long they're taking to go on those trips. Um, so, you know, you can use the mean or the median. It just kind of depends on how the data shakes out. In some cases, those numbers are pretty close together. Um, but in either way, in either way, how you slice it, um, this is important information to know when it comes to, um, the truck activity that's coming to and from a warehouse, you know, how long, where is it going on average? How long is it going? Um, you know, that those are the things we're trying to answer out of this, this information, this particular table doesn't tell us where, but it can tell you, you know, the, the mean or rough average distance. Um, of where a particular vehicle category, um, you know, might go from a warehouse, for example. So um, next slide, please. So to summarize this, this information, this is just a small snippet of, of the information that's, that's included. It's a really robust survey that was done by Sandeg. And the information from that CVS report um, includes truck, I'm sorry, trip and tour information. It includes fleet size, deliveries by origin. It includes, um, it kind of specifies it vehicle by vehicle, uh, it's, it specifies by vehicle class, and it also includes average trip distance. Um, all, this, all this information can be used to help us uh, inform our efforts to calculate truck trip rates and baseline emissions from warehousing activities throughout the county. Uh, so once baseline emissions are calculated, once we can get to that point, emission reductions resulting from a from a potential ISR, if one proceeds, can then be estimated. And then that's going to be an integral part of the district's evaluation of whether to proceed with a regulatory or non-regulatory strategy. So that's why we're kind of working up to this point to look at this data to, to see how it can be used as part of our, our background analysis. And then APCD hopes that some of this information in the report, um, as I mentioned, could be incorporated into some of that baseline emission analysis, um, and that we're hoping to provide some uh, clarity about that analysis at our next working group meeting in October. We want to be able to um, present the overall analysis that we've been doing kind of behind the scenes to look at how much emissions uh, there is in the county stemming from warehouses, how much re reductions you could get from a non-regulatory or regulatory uh, in terms of a regulatory approach if one is proceeds um, and and have a better and get the group's feedback on on where we're going with that. So um, with that, I think we can go to the next slide, which is just a, a question and comments slide. And we'd like to open it up for any feedback and discussion. Um, I'd also like to note that um, I think I saw Tim Garrett on the line today. So um, if if we do have some more, in, if we have some in-depth questions, maybe perhaps about this, the survey report. Again, this is not APCB's report. Um, this is this was a report commissioned by Sandag. 
Um, if there's something that we need Sandag to, to hopefully get into, maybe Tim can um, either provide clarity or, or perhaps connect with the, the folks on his end offline to see if we can get some further clarity. So um, with that, I'll go ahead and open up the room for questions and comments, and uh, I'll go ahead and go to Andrew first. Uh, thanks, Nick. And uh, thank you, Tim, too, from Sandag for putting together such a, a really like robust and very impressive survey. Um, just like you had mentioned before, Nick, the the level at which, you know, the data is presented in these tables and the way that it was executed, I thought was uh, was very well done and very germane to what we're trying to do here as part of a working group. And actually, I thought that one of the there were several other tables that I just wanted to bring to the group's attention because I thought that that really helped to add a lot of context to kind of just not just to how where uh, trucks are operating with respect to the warehousing and transportation industry, but just to, across all commercial sectors in San Diego County as a whole. Um, so you had mentioned over at, on table 11, kind of an average fleet size per establishment. Um, while it's true that the transportation sector has one of the highest fleet counts, when you look over at table 12, uh, table 12 kind of gives an idea of what the average uh, fleet size is across San Diego County. And there, the table 12 shows some 147,000 vehicles throughout San Diego County. And this is an estimate, but from the transportation and warehousing sector, that's roughly 8%. So the amount of fleet vehicles with the transportation and warehousing sector in San Diego County is on par with the retail, your, your retail stores and your wholesalers, which I thought was very interesting. And then if you were to take a look at it, so it's, that's, that's a population of vehicles and you know, one of the best drivers or best predictors of emissions associated with these vehicles comes from their vehicle miles traveled, their, their VMT. And so what jumped out at me was also on table 18 of the report, where they kind of showed um, it's it's a it's a summary of kind of the the survey trips and the distances that all these trucks by their industry class went. And then they they kind of weighted it. They said, OK, if you were to make this a representative amount for all of San Diego County, what really jumped out at me was also just how uh, where transportation fit with its contribution for commercial vehicle miles traveled. It wasn't the first or the second or the third. It was the sixth. Um, and it's it's something like, you know, just shy of six percent of trips, about five percent of vehicle miles traveled from all the commercial sector. You know, for some for some context and for some reference, they said that the education and public services aspect, that's about five times greater than the warehouses. So you you see five times more school bus traffic than you see warehouse traffic, at least according to this to the survey, which I thought was really interesting. And then in the following table with table 19, you know, if you were to break down the fleet sizes or the or the fleets operating in these in these sectors, 50 percent of it's the light vehicles. And so that was kind of one of the things that uh, I know that we had discussed before was, you know, are we looking at that sort of a, uh, you know, when we're looking at the population of these vehicles, the, the big concern comes from the medium and the heavy duty traffic vehicles, but that's only half of the equation and even less so if we were going to account for the advanced clean fleets rule moving forward. So just some really interesting nuggets to, to really chew on and kind of wrap our mind around as far as how big of, a, of an impact on emissions are, is this sector that we're, we're gathering here, is it affecting? And so, you know, VMT is sort of the key, as far as I can tell, to, you know, determining emissions reduction, as well as the cost of electrification. And so you can kind of get an idea of how much it would cost to reduce their contribution to the, to the San Diego air quality as a whole, if you were to electrify it. So very interesting pieces of data. I really recommend everybody to kind of take some time and, and read through it. It's very dense. It's kind of a tough read. You need to kind of pick it up and put it back down, um, but it's well worth exploring and kind of really helps put some context to the situation that we're looking at. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, Andrew. Thanks for the comments. Um, you know, I, I would recommend that everybody take a look at the survey. Um, you know, it's the, the idea of a survey has been brought up a few times here at the working group in past meetings. And the one of the, the reasons that we did like this particular data is it really, um, you know, short of doing a, a, a specific dedicated survey, which would be, um, you know, probably pretty time consuming and the, the usefulness of the data would be, 
we, we'd have to see. Uh, but um, the robustness of this information was really what intrigued us um, to it. Um, and, it, you know, the, the amount of data that was collected by apps and, you know, these are these are things that, um, you know, we probably wouldn't be able to do in-house, to be honest, um, if APCD were, were to conduct their own surveys. So this is why and it was it was pretty recently done as well. So um, I would recommend and in, in take you to Andrew's uh uh, words there to to take a look at the survey for your own use um and there's a lot of good information in there to uh to chew on in there uh, i did just want to clarify real quick in case it wasn't clear um because that that term of transportation um was mentioned a, a few times in terms of the sector um the industry group i think um that is tip that is i believe the one that we're referring to uh when it comes to um uh where to truck activity that is emanating to and from a warehouse. Uh, is that, I just wanna make sure Randy, did I characterize that right? I think there was a question I received about um, does transportation sector equate to, to warehousing in, in general? Is that correct? I just wanna make sure I'm, I'm being totally accurate with that. That, that was our assumption, uh, Nick. Um, it's, we can't really break it down in terms of, you know, uh, retail and other non-warehousing activities. But we think it's, as far as we know, from what we can tell from the table, um, that warehousing would be part of that um, general transportation umbrella. Yeah, and, and if I if I can very quickly, there I think they're referring to the uh, the NAICS code specifically. So the the transportation transportation slash warehousing NAICS code is what encompasses that. Great, thank you both for that for that clarity on that. Uh, Tim. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, just appreciate the um, folks congratulating the effort. Uh, certainly was a big effort from uh, Sandag side to do this commercial vehicle survey along with the consultant team. But just additional context, you know, it's it's um, it's great that it can be useful for you know exploring um, uh, you know warehouse indirect source rule potentially or other strategies. But just additional context, it wasn't developed specifically for this purpose. Um, we do uh, this survey as well as other surveys of different travel behavior across the region in order to develop the regional transportation uh, demand model for the regional plan. So looking at commercial travel, also looking at personal travel via a bunch of different modes. So just contextualizing it that, you know, it's useful for, for some things, but maybe not, um, but yeah, not every, not every bit of information is directly applicable um, as, as Nick and um, Randy were saying. So uh, but yeah, I encourage everyone to to um, look into the survey um, report, and I can follow up with uh, if you have any questions. If you want to direct those to me, great. Yeah, thank you, Tim. I appreciate the good, the good context there. It's a, it's it's useful data, and we we can utilize it potentially for this effort. But yeah, well, this was not the purpose of of a, the original <laughs> intent of it. Um, but we do we do appreciate that uh, context there. Um, and then um, I see in the chat, just for the purposes of the recording, uh, that Andrew agrees with Tim on that and that he's very interested to hear how the survey will factor into ABM3. Um, and I, I don't know if that's, I don't want to put you on the spot, Tim, maybe for that, but it, do you maybe have a, an update on, on when the new data for ABM3 or how maybe the scheduling moving forward, just for the, for the, the benefit of the group of how that's going to proceed? Um, if you if you can't answer it right away, that's fine. We can. <laughs> we yeah, can I, I, I can't say in specific dates. Um, and so we have the commercial vehicle survey. It's been completed. There's a commercial vehicle model that is being um, developed, and uh, I think primarily has been developed, has been wrapped up. Um, that kind of like turns this into model data. That's one of many components into the activity based model, the three ABM three. Um, so. There are many other components we're used, we're testing that now as we develop our 2025 regional plan um, for you know initial concept runs. The data won't be available to be released um, you know, for you know, in great detail until 2025, until next year. So probably at least six more months before we can really um, talk more about it um, because primary goal with um, developing all these surveys and models is to develop the regional plan. So. That's the primary thing what we're working on and then the results of that need to be presented to our board before we can kind of go on to additional applications so um, no specific timeline we're but 
commercial vehicle survey, this is this will be part of the, the ABM three. So yeah, that's useful. Thanks, Tim. And it's it's helpful that it's knowing that the this information, the the purpose of it will, will then kind of be encompassed into future regional plans that are coming, it sounds like in fairly short order. So yeah, I haven't I haven't been on I've been on the peripheries of the regional plan uh discussions. So um appreciate the, the context for what the timeline is for that stuff. So thank you for that. Um, are there any other questions, comments, feedback about this commercial vehicle vehicle survey report? Uh, Charles. Hello. Um, I just wanted to point out a piece of information that I found pretty interesting. Um, but in figure 20, it talks about a sample size and how 98% of light and medium vehicles and 90% of heavy duty trucks started and ended within the San Diego region, which I found pretty interesting. Um, obviously, we know it's not, well, this study wasn't designed for the APCD ISR, but, you know, just talking about um, truck fleets and potentially in the future with zero emission trucks, I think it's just an interesting bit of information that um, stood out to me. So I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, that is an interesting figure, Charles. I, I uh, appreciate you bringing that up. That's a that's an interesting feedback. Uh, I see Tim. I'm not sure whose the hand was up first. It might have been Tim or Nicholas, but whoever, <laughs> feel, feel free to self-police yourself on who went first on there. Great. Yeah, I'll, I'll just chime in quickly as a, as a quick response um, that this is also isn't the entire universe of trips that are happening in the region. You know, this is the sample size that we that the survey was based on is establishments that are located in the San Diego region. So like with businesses, you know, like with the physical location in San Diego, and then it's like the trips of the vehicles that are going to and from those businesses. So there are other trips passing through the region, for example, that aren't going to be in this um, in this universe of trips. So yeah. That's all I'll say with that one. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Tim. Um, Nicholas Powell and then uh, Matt Trano. Yeah. You know, I just kind of piggybacking off of Charles's comment. Um, and I thought the report was really great and and uh, the the detail that it, it provided. Um, I think there were some like estimates on average trips for heavy duty trucks. I think it was like 14 miles or 19 minutes. Um, you know, I think that for me, um, just kind of gives some, some great context to the, the type of activity that a lot of, uh, industries are, are doing. These are short truck trips that I think are, um, really, really perfect for zero emission, uh, adoption, right? They're, I feel like often there's conversation about long hauls that are happening and, and limited ranges with zero emission vehicles. But, you know, if I'm reading this study, right. You know, the, the average for industry is 14 miles a trip, um, which is pretty manageable with the technology we have today. And so, yeah, I think um, it was a great report. Thank you for providing it. Yeah, appreciate those comments, Nicholas. Yeah, it's it's interesting, and, and and keep in mind, I think that that caveat from Tim probably still applies to this to that uh, comment too, uh, in regards to you know based on the the establishments that were considered in this report, which there were quite a few establishments, if I recall right, um, you know, so it's but it doesn't capture everything, which is that's that's definitely clear, uh, but of the ones that were were participating, it does uh, appear that most of them are doing kind of short trips that would be well suited to, um, you know, kind of a technology like a zero emission technology. Um, if they're doing kind of a, you know, a 14 mile um, trip. Now, if you, you, you multiply that a few times a day, um, depending on where they're going, then, then the math, you know, it probably just depends on the situation, whether it would work for your particular fleet or not. But um, nonetheless, it's it, every every single situation is going to be a little different, but we're looking to try and see, you know, on average what the region is doing. And that's what we liked about this survey was, you know, we didn't really know before looking at the survey what San Diego fleets were doing. Um, and so that's the benefit of uh, even getting a small uh, picture of what fleets are doing in, in this space and in other spaces 
to be honest, that are outside of warehousing. So it's 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 really a benefit for a lot of a lot of different things. Um, are there any other comments or questions? If not, I think we're right on time. So we can probably shift gears to our next topic, but I do appreciate everybody's uh, feedback on, on this and would encourage everybody to um, take a look at the survey on at your own disposal uh, in time. There's a, a, Janet posted a link in the chat so you can take a look at that um, at your leisure. Um, so I think we'll go ahead and get to our next uh, section, which will be covered by Randy. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to uh, Randy. If you're if you're ready, go for it. Right. Thank you, Nick. Mm -hmm. On March 15th, 2024, South Coast AQMD staff provided an update to their mobile source committee on the WARE program following the first two years of implementation. The WARE program is South Coast's indirect source rule 2305 which regulates warehouse facilities to reduce emissions from the goods movement industry. We'll be, we will be going over some of their presentation slides today. Per Rule 2305, there are three reports that are required to be submitted. Warehouse Operations Notification, WON, is a one-time notification submitted by the warehouse owner. Initial Site Information Report, ISIR, is a one-time report submitted by the warehouse operator and Annual Wear Report, AWR, is an annual report submitted by the warehouse operator. Next slide, please. This slide shows the actions being taken by warehouse operators to earn wear points reported for 2022 and 2023. The various wear menu options are color-coded. For example, zero emission, ZE, Hostler usage is shown in red, and near zero emission, NZE, or natural gas truck usage, is shown in yellow. The first compliance year in 2022 includes phase one, which are warehouses 250,000 square feet and greater. The amount of wear points earned increased in 2023 for two reasons. The inclusion of phase two, which are warehouses between 150,000 and 250,000 square feet, and the increased stringency of the rule for phase one warehouses. Some of the top options reported to earn wear points include ZE Hostler usage, solar panel installation and usage, and near zero truck usage. Note that South Coast AQMD staff are currently auditing the reported data and consequently these numbers may get corrected. Next slide, please. This table lists the various wear menu options that support the transition to ZE equipment, the number of instances reported for each option, and the number of facilities that reported using those options. A few actions to highlight from this table include ZE Hostler acquisition, 189 units acquired for 96 facilities. According to South Coast AQMD staff, these hostlers or yard trucks would not have been acquired if not for Rule 2305 because they were not commonly used prior to the rule. ZE Hostler usage, over 1.7 million hours across 130 facilities. This shows that these hostlers are currently being used. The difference of 130 facilities using hostlers and 96 that acquired them indicate either the number of hostlers that existed prior to the rule or hostlers may have been acquired due to the use of incentive funds that could not have been used to comply with a rule. And finally, ZE Class 8 truck visits, about 240,000 visits at 185 facilities. The intent of Rule 2305 is to scale, that is, increase use of ZE equipment. These ZE Class 8 truck visits show the beginning of this scaling. However, these visits represent less than 1% of all truck visits to warehouses. So there's still a long way to go. Next slide, please. This chart shows the reporting rates as a percentage of the total anticipated reports to be submitted. For example, the dashed line on the left shows 1,039 estimated phase one warehouses in the South Coast AQMD region. 
Inside that dashed line are the reported rates for the various reports. Initial site information report, ISIR, shown in green. 2022 annual wear report, AWR in purple. And 2023 AWR in blue. On the right side of the chart are the reporting rates for the estimated 1,059 phase two warehouses. There is no purple bar shown for phase two because their first compliance period started last year and are thus required to submit the AWR for 2023. More work remains to be done by South Coast AQMD staff to improve all of these reporting rates. To date, the compliance rate with Rule 2305 is not at 100% which is to be expected in a new rulemaking. Next slide, please. This chart shows the reported wear points earned shown in blue relative to the wear points compliance obligation shown in purple. Wear points earned resulted from implementation of the various wear menu options. The wear points, wear points compliance obligation is the number of points required by rule 2305 and is calculated from the total annual truck trips to and from the facilities. The wear points earned exceeded the compliance obligation for phase one and phase two facilities. A small portion of the points came from mitigation fees. The surplus wear points earned over the compliance obligation can be banked by warehouse operators and used to meet the requirements of future compliance years. Next slide, please. This chart shows the weekly number of phone calls and emails with stakeholders between August 2023 and February 2024 to assist them in submitting the required reports. In September 2023, a compliance advisory was sent to more than 5,000 addresses to help improve the, the compliance rate. The trend shows an increase in the period of January through February 2024, with a peak of nearly 450 weekly correspondences by South Coast AQMD staff. This corresponded with a filing deadline of the annual reports due at the beginning of the year. This slide illustrates the level of compliance efforts by South Coast AQMD staff to implement their Rule 2305, which was adopted in 2021, with approximately 3,300 warehouses subject to that rule. As a reminder, Rule 2305 applies to warehouses in the South Coast AQMD region that are 100,000 square feet or larger. If a potential ISR for the San Diego region is developed and adopted, a similar level of compliance assistance in terms of time and resources may be required by APCD staff to implement. Also, the level of assistance may increase if the potential ISR applies to warehouses smaller than 100,000 square feet. Next slide, please. So are there any questions or comments you may have on the WEAR program implementation update? Thanks, Randy. And just while we're waiting for comments and some questions coming in, I just wanted to kind of do a quick kind of couple takeaways from the, uh, the information that was presented. And, and I did want to see if, um, if, uh, if Ian was still on the line, I'm not sure he is, um, but if he had a, a chance to uh, take a look at that information or if he had any other comments about it. I don't see Ian on the line, but maybe, I know there was someone else from South Coast, but if we if we need to correct anything, this would be the time. So <laughs> just wanna make sure that was, that was uh, understood and, and clear. And so, and just a couple takeaways if, while we're waiting on on some um, other feedback from others. You know, um, some of the key takeaways that I think we've had um, in looking through this data. And and as a reminder, we we presented kind of the first year of implementation results from South Coast. I want to say early on in our in our warehouse working group um, efforts. Um, this is kind of the next iteration of that. The second year and seeing where that regulation is going and you know what's what's happening that's positive what's happening that's not positive um you know and, and just kind of looking at the overall scope of of what's happening up there if a rulemaking were to proceed here 
Um, some things could be translatable, some things may not. Um, but it's useful information as we, as we look towards, um, you know, one of the only examples that exists in terms of an indirect source rule for warehouses um, is, to, is looking at what South, how, South, how the South Coast effort is going. Um, so, um, you know, we're seeing that, you know, there's not a lot of points being earned though uh, through the mitigation efforts. There was, um, you know, some, some, no, there was uh, some folks that were not sure if, you know, the mitigation points were useful or not useful. Um, while that is an option, doesn't look doesn't appear that many facilities are utilizing that option in in large numbers, at least from the first two years of implementation. And we're also seeing that a lot of facilities are um, accruing more points than, frankly, they need to to that are obligated by the rule. Um, that that could be. Um, you know, to take advantage of early banking and, and those sorts of things. But um, when you start looking at that bar chart that had the blue and the purple, um, you know, the purple being the the uh, compliance obligation, the, the blue points. Uh, yeah, that one. Thank you. Um, you can see that there's there's quite a bit more points being um, generated or earned um, through actions being done at the facilities than are actually obligated. So that's an interesting um, tidbit that we saw. We're also seeing, uh, we are all start, also starting to see zero emission, um, you know, usage um, and, and that in, in, a, in a couple of different sectors, we were seeing it through in the trucks by, by uh, more trucks being used, but we're also seeing it uh, through the zero emission yard hostler usage. That's, um, that's quite a bit of points being utilized uh, up in the South Coast region from uh, zero emission yard hostlers. These are yard trucks or things that are moving around from site to site, uh, you know, big containers more than likely. Um, and so one caveat to this data, uh, in, in this is one of the things that may not be completely translatable is, you know, we don't have, we have some yard trucks in the San Diego region, but we certainly don't have the number that, that um, the South Coast region has. Um, so there, there's some things about that data that, that could certainly be, um, you know, we'd have to we'd have to see if a if a rulemaking were to proceed in San Diego. You know, would we expect to see a similar kind of breakdown in terms of yard hostler usage to um, comply with a rulemaking? That's that that's kind of an unknown um, there. Um, and then the last point I wanted to uh, just highlight, and this was in you saw it on the last slide in terms of compliance assistance, that this is this is a fairly heavy lift in, in terms of um, you know implementing. The rulemaking that they are doing and um there's a lot of calls a lot of uncertainty um a lot of questions that come into south coast staff it was um if we can pull up that slide that had the the compliance assistance uh graph um i think it was uh these are the weekly correspondence with stakeholders and you can see that spike up in uh, the the beginning part of the year that's i believe when reporting comes in and these are on the, this is about 400 calls a week that they're getting uh, in terms of, you know, how to comply, what do I need to support, uh, to, to report. So there, there's quite a heavy lift on the district's part to, um, to implement something like that. So that's definitely consideration that we're taking in mind as well. Um, so I'm going to shut up for a second and I'm going to <laughs> go to the hands that have been raised. I know there was a few that kind of raised and, and went down. Uh, but I'm going to start with Andrew and then go to Charles really. Hi, thanks, Nick. And actually, your your last comment there about the compliance assistance aspect was was speaks right to kind of where my mind went as well was and actually it it I'm glad you clarified that it was weekly. My assumption was that it was monthly. And so I was going to say, oh, yeah, fifteen to twenty calls a day during the peak season. but no, it's it sounds like it's a it's a fair bit more extensive than that. And so from a, from a resource perspective, does does this kind of give the district a scope as far as like what would be expected or what kind of extra resources that they would need? And, and would it be pulling from the same team or same pool of resources that would be assisting from like the Title V permits and the other permitting actions that, uh, that the district is pursuing as well? Yeah, Andrew, I, I, those are good questions that that frankly, I don't think we can answer right now. Um, you know, that a lot of that would depend on what kind of structure we end up going with. I don't know if we're proceeding with an ISR rule. There could be a mixture of an, I, an ISR rule or non-regulatory strategy and incentive program. 
and how those things would break out in terms of who would cover what. Uh, there's a lot of questions still there that that would need to be answered. But uh, those keeping we are we we have been um, keeping track of what's been happening in South Coast in terms of the workload and and the um, resources that they've been putting into their respective program just to make sure that we're um, you know aware of what's going on if, if something were to proceed down that uh, down a similar road. Um, and some of those numbers and figures we put into our ISR framework document um, that we released back in June of 2023. So, um, you know, some of that, some of those metrics we, we were already aware of and we're continuing to keep in tabs with them um, to, to see how things develop over there. Hey, Nick, this is Mike. And if I can just sort of add on to that, I think, you know, to your point, it's difficult for us to sort of assess what additional resources may be needed and you know until we actually you know get direction to proceed with the rulemaking and and you know that process will help sort of play that out but but i think one of andrew's questions was you know would we be pulling from existing resources uh, i think we can fairly confidently answer you know no we would likely need additional resources to implement um a, a program like this obviously that could vary depending on scale but um you know thinking about you know, the number of warehouses that we've looked at based on the various data sources that we've seen, even if we were to, you know, set a threshold of, you know, 100,000 square feet or possibly something even smaller than that, um, I think I think we'd be hard pressed to be able to implement um, a program um, without looking at additional resources to, to, to be able to implement it effectively. So I, it's a little bit of a squishy answer, Andrew, but but I think. Um, you know the, the short answer is if if a program moves forward we would we would likely be unable to to use to to, to implement it with the existing resources we have in house oh, and i and i appreciate your your response to that because the you know my my initial concern was you know from a from a permitting aspect you know how a lot of the facilities and the stationary sources are trying to you know come up with newer technologies, better better emitting technologies that require going through the permitting process and just ensuring that that process stays, you know, flowing and moving through in addition to all these other initiatives is, uh, I think was key. So yeah, so thanks for the answer. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks Andrew and uh, Mike for chiming in on that. Um, let's go, we'll go to Charles and then the next uh, person up will be, uh, sorry, it's jumping around. Uh, Regina. So, Charles. Hi. Um, just a quick point for what I thought about this. Thank you for this presentation. This was great. Um, I just think that as we are continuing to see industries around the state move into more cleaner and zero emission futures, um, we're just seeing with the South Coast rule that a lot of warehouses are ready to invest now to provide these um, cleaner and zero emission vehicles and different um, just options on their um, warehouses to just invest in their futures now. Um, the South Coast rule has helped to move this forward in, in, in their region because of the incentive programs that are being offered. But, you know, we're seeing so many are already performing now, are already overperforming now, sorry. Um, so, you know, I just think it's 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 good to see this data and um, helpful to see. And it's interesting that the mitigation program isn't being used as much as I would have thought from the beginning. So um, just my thoughts, but thank you for this. Yeah, thanks for that feedback, Charles. Uh, Regina? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Randy, for the presentation. Um, I agree with what's been raised and um, that seeing implementation of the warehouse ISR in South Coast is important and relevant for this work group. I just wanted to confirm that um, the slide on the deployment of zero emissions, like the different menu items, that that is the total since the rule was adopted, it, it seems like that is, and, but just wanted to confirm. Um, and second, if you have any estimates on emission reductions associated with these actions that have been reported and purportedly taken, because I think that would be of interest and obviously very important for this discussion. Yes, Regina. So those are good two questions. So I, I want to say that um, while we didn't include it in this report, the the update that AQMD gave um, to their uh, mobile source committee, which these slides came from, 
um, did have some preliminary estimates about emission reductions um, that they were anticipating. Um, I don't have that number offhand, but it was it was on par for what they were expecting um, at this stage in the rulemaking. Um, clearly, you know, translating what that would do in terms of what San Diego would do, you know, I think the reason why we didn't want to put those in that slide is is to make the distinction that the reductions they could get in South Coast would be similar to what we get here because it's they're two different scales in terms of truck activity and that sort of thing. But um, what we can do is maybe perhaps send out a link um, to the um, Mobile Source Committee uh, presentation that they did uh, afterwards, or we can post it up on our Warehouse Working Group website so that you could get a flavor for what re reductions they were thinking about on that, if that's helpful. And then on, on, on your first question in terms of um, if this is the total amount of, of instances that they were seeing since the rule was adopted, based on what I'm seeing on the slide, I believe that is the case. Um, it, it's in that paragraph on the right under the deploying zero mission, it says results based on reported information since rule adoption. And I, another key there, just to not to, to highlight, we said it in the presentation, was it's subject to audit by South Coast. Um, when they presented this to their uh, mobile source committee, I want to say in March, um, it was pretty early data that they got. And, you know, this was now six months later <laughs> by the time that we're presenting it to everyone here today. So I imagine these numbers have gone up quite a bit. Um, but um, as of the time that they were doing it and, and they were still subject to some further audit um, by their staff to see if it, what was reported was truly accurate, um, you know, these were the numbers that they were initially seeing. Um, let's see, we'll go to Matt Trino. Thanks, Nick. Um, you actually had a great segue. I wanted to make a, a comment on scale. Um, so as we look at these South Coast kind of adoption numbers so far, it's important to, to put scale in perspective. So between LA, the IE and Orange County, which makes up South Coast boundary, there's 2 billion square feet of warehouse product. Um, that's total inventory. So 2 billion. In San Diego County, there's 200 million. So we are, we are really 10% the size of South Coast in terms of our existing warehouse inventory. Um, so important to think about really looking at, if you had similar adoption, you'd be looking at 10% of these numbers. Yeah, Matt, that, that's an interesting observation. And, and like I said, I, I will also kind of caveat it with, again, Complete translation of what we might see in South Coast may not complete completely translate to what we might see here uh, in San Diego. Again, that zero emission hostler usage is one that we're, you know, debating if that would be the same kind of metric in terms of, um, you know, would we really see a lot of hours used in terms of zero emission hostler usage in San Diego when we know there just isn't as many um, of those here? So would that be you know, counterbalanced by other actions uh, potentially through through other zero emission uh, menu categories remains to be seen. But but I think I think your point in terms of scale is 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 um, correct. That you know there is there is a lot of trucking activity that occurs in the South Coast region just based on how far and wide it goes. Um, so that that is definitely um, clear. Uh, let's see, Tim. Thanks, Nick. It really jumps out at me the reporting rates um, being so low, and you know maybe these numbers have been updated a little bit since then. But you know, seeing forty percent, sixty percent, something like that of the businesses that South Coast AQMD was expecting to be reporting data, um, really it kind of suggests that either they overestimated or there are a lot of companies out there that are not reporting. Um, mm -hmm. and, I like to think that it's, you know, maybe they just didn't understand, but that seems like a lot of companies that could possibly just be like skirting the rule, um, which seems like it's a, it would probably be really challenging to to correct that. I'm, I'm hoping it's kind of more just the overestimation of the number of facilities that the rule would apply to, but um, 
yeah, those numbers are just a lot lower than I expected. Yeah, thanks, Tim. It, it's it's something that I know South Coast is working on uh, behind the scenes, and 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 like any rulemaking, I mean, this is not this is not something that is unique to um, to an ISR rulemaking. I would say um, any new rule is going to have kind of a a ramp up in terms of uh, compliance and reporting. If the, if such requirements exist in the rule, there's there's going to be kind of a transition period for people to kind of get up to speed. And with the complexity of, of of this particular rulemaking up in South Coast, um, you know that's kind of compounded, I think, with that. So, um, you know, I, I don't think it's unexpected that the, the the reporting rates would be lower, but I do know that South Coast is working hard to try and um, get those rates a little higher, and um, you know, doing doing things to their extent that to help that. Um, Michelle, hi. Um... I just want to highlight that this is a report from AQMD and we don't see the other side of it. Uh, how is this affecting industry's choices as in our uh, warehouse operators choosing to leave, break their lease, um, move to smaller warehouses, for instance? Because I've heard some anecdotal stories about uh, warehouse operators choosing to leave and um, when AQMZ studied, they did a report or commission one before the rule, there was a report that said that um, it, it there was no expectation that warehouses would leave. But I've seen data, for instance, that says um, urban infill areas are seeing higher rents for warehouses. And then uh, the, where what is it? I have a report in front of me. Um, Inland Empire, the rents are going lower. So I'm I'm wondering if that's because warehouse operators are choosing to move to smaller warehouses that don't have to meet this rule um, in a more urban environment that is closer to customers. So it, it, I don't know if AQMD is going to study um, what's happening in the market, but that's something that I'm interested in and I think other industry members would be interested in that too. Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting uh, observation there, Michelle. I see Ian's hand up, so maybe he can uh, chime in on on this particular question. Ian. Uh, yeah, no, that's a that is a good observation. It's something that we've uh, definitely been curious about. Uh, in our first annual report, we did put um, just a very very small write up on. Uh, vacancy rates and rents uh, for the warehousing industry, just because we wanted to see how that's progressing since the rule was adopted. Uh, we have seen that vacancy has gone up in warehousing uh, and, you know, prices are sort of adjusting accordingly, but we also are looking at that nationally and that you know, there's been a general pullback in the economy overall uh, that nationally markets, you know, we look at Dallas, Fort Worth or, or uh, Georgia or New York, New Jersey or other areas around the country that they also have had a pullback and in some cases a bigger pullback than in our region. And so what we've seen is that that everything that we're seeing here is really consistent with what is happening with the national economy. Uh, we haven't seen statistically that there's any um, uh, difference in the warehousing market than one would expect. Uh, but it, it is something we're going to continue to watch. Yeah, thank you, Ian. Appreciate that context. Are there any other questions, comments on on this uh, information from AQMD? If not, this this was good feedback that we got. So I would appreciate everybody's uh, time and attention and listening through that data. Um, so I think we'll go ahead and move on. We're right on time, so we are we are doing great right now. Uh, everybody appreciate <laughs> sticking on track with timing here. Um, so we'll go ahead and move on to our next topic, which will be to um, go back to something that we. Um, you know, talked about a little bit at past meetings in looking at the data that we were looking at from Sandeg, uh, which is model data 
and then comparing it to um, real truck activity data, which is something, you know, that truck counts that come from Caltrans at, at freeway areas primarily. So we wanted to kind of circle back around to that for the group to, to we did, uh, Randy has done some pretty good analysis in looking and comparing those two. And um, we just wanted to kind of close the loop on that to see what we've been seeing in the comparison between those two data sets. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Randy and he can, kind of give a quick overview of what we've been seeing. Thank you, Nick. Um, as Nick mentioned, the next agenda item today looks at a comparison between truck traffic counts, which are measured, measured data, and modeled truck volumes. The goal of this exercise was to determine the degree of alignment between measured and modeled truck data. Caltrans maintains on their website the annual average daily traffic, AADT, for total truck counts at various freeway junctions. AADT is the total volume for the year divided by 365 days. Traffic counting is generally performed by electronic counting instruments moved from locations throughout the state in a program of continuous traffic count sampling. The resulting counts are adjusted to an estimate of annual average daily traffic by compensating for seasonal influence, weekly variation, and other variables which may be present. In 2016, traffic, truck traffic counts were measured at 172 specific junctions along the various freeways in San Diego County, such as I-5, I-8, and I-15. Of those 172 freeway junctions, district staff looked at 49 locations comparing the Caltrans truck traffic count data versus Sandag's activity-based model ABM 2 plus of total truck volumes. The activity based model used 2016 as the base year. Per the Caltrans data, the total daily truck traffic count at the 49 freeway junctions was about 303,000. In comparison, the total daily modeled truck volume at the same 49 junctions was about 269,000. For these 49 freeway junctions reviewed, on average, the activity-based model total daily truck volumes were about 11% less than the total truck, truck traffic counts. This comparison helps demonstrate that the district's approach of using model data to calculate truck trip rates as discussed in the June WWG meeting is reasonable and potentially conservative compared to using actual truck counts. Next slide, please. Finally, we'll go over two suggested data sets for future evaluation. The first is a working paper by the International Council on Clean Transportation, ICCT, entitled A Meta-Study of Purchase Costs for Zero Emission Trucks. The paper presents a review of the literature on the retail prices for battery electric and hydrogen fuel cell tractor trucks. In addition, information about the costs of key components for zero emission trucks including the battery pack, motor, and energy storage systems are provided. The information presented in the paper may be a resource used in the district's cost-effectiveness analysis of a potential warehouse ISR. The second is the California GoBiz website that contains information on establishments classified under various industry types, such as business name, address, sales, and employee count. The information on the website may be a resource in identifying businesses that may conduct warehousing activities. We'd like to thank IEA for bringing these data sets to our attention as staff plans to incorporate them into future analyses. Because the district is still evaluating whether or not to proceed with a regulatory or non-regulatory strategy, encompassing these additional data sets would occur if we were to proceed with such analyses in the next phase of our overall warehouse efforts. Though we understand the importance in utilizing the best available data, we also are cognizant of the work that can be done at this stage of the overall analysis. That said, we do think this data could be utilized to some extent in the next phase. Next slide, please. So are there any questions or comments you may have on the Caltrans AADT and model data comparison or the suggested data sets? Thanks, Randy. 
Um, I see uh, Andrew Aguilar. And then we'll go to Tim after that. Thanks, Nick. And I promise this will be my last comment for the afternoon. Um, but this is just with respect to um, to kind of again comparing the numbers to to the model. And and I appreciate doing that that kind of due diligence check of checking against kind of the model outputs vice uh, some known traffic counts. And and I, I would you know Tim, I don't know if you have any. Um, insight into how the model for ABM2 was calibrated, but it would make sense to me that, that the modelers would calibrate to a known data set like something from Caltrans. And and the the danger though, when it comes to kind of using models or saying that something is calibrated is is the purpose of it. You know, in a, in a past life before I, I joined where I am now, I was a consultant for the Navy and I did a lot of uh, water system modeling, potable water systems. So these are much simpler models and you would find different data sets like pressure and water quality to, to make sure that the model that you were using was calibrated for our purpose. But the purpose that we were doing and the purpose for a lot of these models isn't to predict at a, at a certain point what the traffic is looking like. And so we're talking, you know, calibrating to freeway level traffic, but if we were to extend that down to the street level and finger level that we would, like we were talking about over the last several months, which would be perfect and ideal, that's not there, or at least I would be, I would be very reluctant and, and caution against going that way. These models are really meant for a kind of a trend analysis or sensitivity to, to trends. If we were to build a development over here or widen the street over here, not necessarily for predicting that traffic. And, and even then, like I'm excited that, that the ABM three model is going to account for the commercial vehicle survey traffic as, as well, or at least the, the inputs from that, from what I understand. But even then, you know, it's, it, still raises the question of you know how are the what how is the establishment population made where are those trucks going you know how are we saying that they're going to go in one spot versus another uh, the total population of those vehicles the total vmt all of that is still up for question and so that's why one of the things that i would i would take away is is using that commercial vehicle data survey to kind of characterize how the trucks are going in san diego how far they're going, what industries are they serving, and kind of get a, a sensitivity on that as opposed to trying to nail it down to the specific street level. Because I, I just don't think that the model, you know, regardless of kind of what these newer additions would be, uh, is designed for that. And so that's that's really my only big hesitation and my really huge warning as a modeler myself on a much, much simpler uh, system would, would warn for the group. Yeah, thanks, Andrew, for the feedback. Tim, I, I, there was a couple of questions, I think, mixed in there. Um, I don't know if you wanted to maybe try and answer some of those. And I know you had your hand up before that. So whatever you want to do on that front. Yeah, I can make one contribution. And that's that I know our ABM uh, volumes are supposed to be spitting out uh, an average weekday volume. Uh, and so I don't know if that lines up perfectly with like the annual average of daily traffic that, um, that Caltrans um, is collecting. So those numbers might not match up perfectly. And I think that that is not necessarily an issue. Um, I can follow up on that to see how those are supposed to line up. Um, but I do know that the, the Caltrans, um, the, the traffic census is one of the, um, one of the data sources that's used to, uh, to validate the model. Uh, along with other data sources, like we get some traffic counts from local jurisdictions as well, some cities, um, and then some other uh, kind of like project-based or one-off traffic counts that we get um, um, throughout the region. So it's one of the data sources. I expect um, that they would align a little bit closer than 11%, um, but there, there's probably a methodological reason, uh, reason why they're not uh, lining up more closely than that. Yeah, thanks, Tim. I appreciate that. I think one thing we were seeing and looking at the the different and keep in mind these were these were specific junctions that we had that they're not everything in the Sandag model data completely correlated to the Caltrans data, which is only on freeways. So we were left with you know certain areas where we had to look and 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 compare. Um, it's a very small subset of of the overall counts that I think were were in that um, both in the Caltrans data and the Sandag data. But it's nonetheless a, a you know a comparison point to see you know how they look. I think in some points they were a little closer to being roughly around the same. In some in others they were probably a little less. There's some variability there, but in terms of the overall average, I think is what we were 
looking at across those four, uh, 48 or 49 junctions. You know, we were seeing somewhat, um, you know, the the 11% actually felt pretty close to us. And knowing what we know in terms of, you know, this is this 2016 vintage data that we were looking at for both Caltrans and Sandag uh, model data. We, we know, um, you know, just anecdotally that truck activity has gone up post COVID uh, in, in just kind of the, the new way of things that are delivered and there's more deliveries happening. There's a lot more activity happening in the trucking space since, since COVID, um, you know, so we're expecting these numbers to, to, to jump a little bit when, when these, um, new ABM numbers are, are put out, we'll have to see if the numbers back that up, but, um, we, we think there's a good possibility of that. And we'd be happy to do a, a comparison again um, at that point, if need be, to see, you know, how are those numbers correlating to each other? Um, Jack, I see your hand up. Thanks, Nick. Um, I wanted to go back and see you kind of talk about, hang on a second. Turn my phone off here. Um, so, the outcome was, or the or the takeaway was that there is an 11.4 percent difference between these two data sources, um, and you, and if I heard it right, you indicated that that was what you would determine to be acceptable for verification that the modeling approach was acceptable. Um, I'm wondering what percentage would be unacceptable? How high? Um, how much of a difference? is required between these two methods to uh, determine or, or conclude that, wait a second, um, modeling isn't supported by these, these other, this other data source. Yeah, I, I don't think we have an exact number in mind for that, Jack. I mean, it's a good question, but um, you know, I don't think we have a, an exact number in, in our mind about that. If we were starting to see in doing this analysis though, that we were looking you know, 20, 30, 40% off, I mean, we would, it, that would probably, you know, set off some alarm bells in, in trying to see, um, you know, either on the positive or negative end, you know, is this, is this the data that, uh, you know, should we rely upon this data? Um, you know, I think a five to 10% difference is probably a reasonable aspect, to be honest, uh, just in, just in my own personal stance i have nothing really to kind of you know set on that um but you know to expect the numbers to be exactly right all the time probably is going to be the case with the model um you know we're trying to do our the model is really just trying to do its best to to portray what's at, what's going on in real life and there's a lot more things that go into it like like tim that was saying there's a lot of different traffic counts um, even the traffic count process itself is somewhat, um, you know, having done that myself in a prior life and sitting out on the freeway on, on a bridge doing, doing the traffic counts for Caltrans, um, that is also not an exact science, <laughs> I hate to say. But, um, you know, so there's a lot of human variability that goes into just flat traffic counts as well. So, um, you know, I think there's going to be some variability there on the positive or negative, but in terms of having an exact percentage of what we're looking at, I don't think we have that. Okay, I, I think this this question of modeling is going to be a, an important one for us. Um, I can see, and we I, when I think about how much time we spent talking about this in all our previous meetings, it's going to be way more time than, than certainly most governing board members would want to hear uh, a discussion take place. So I was just wondering if there isn't, there's no standard. There's no um, scientific research auditing sort of standard that that indicates that if you're comparing, <clears throat> compare, excuse me, comparing two data sources, uh, and you want to verify that they support each other, um, that there is some percentage of error that is considered to be completely acceptable, and and maybe at some point uh, the percentage difference is is uh, uh, raises doubts about uh, being able to use the other one. So just is there is there no standard out there for this? I mean, I'm not aware of one, but we can certainly investigate it. Uh, we we can certainly take a look and see what might be out there um, in, in terms of getting some kind of sense uh, of that. You know, we're we're quickly getting schooled up on 
on a lot of things statistics wise uh, through this effort to, to better understand, you know, correlation coefficients and, you know, doing stuff like that. So we can look into that to see if we, you know, is, if there's any metric to kind of give us some more um, comfort level on, on, you know, how close those are going to be. And keep in mind too, I mean, this is just for 49, 49 points. They are kind of scattered throughout the county. It's not for every single data set. Um, so there's going to be some caveats, even if we are able to do that, I think. But right. uh, but we can certainly investigate that a little bit more and seeing if there's some some other kind of statistical metrics that we can look at to to see. Yeah, this is something that, um, you know, is is relatively close or not. You know, I, it, there could be a, a scale there that we're just not quite sure of yet. So but we wanted to at least share it with the group. And Nick, if I, if I might, Jack. Thanks. That's a that's a good yeah. suggestion. I, I was going to say the same thing. I think we look for for what sorts of, um, you know, measurements there may be there that we can we can kind of compare. I, I think the other piece and, and Nick touched on it a little bit is also maybe circling back with Caltrans to find out about, you know, why some of those dis differences might exist. I know uh, we heard Tim mention that the ABM data is weekdays. You know, if the Caltrans data is seven days a week, you know, that could be part of that difference as well. And so I think both of those things looking at you know, is there some sort of standardized, you know, deviation, if you will, um, that we could apply to this analysis and then trying to maybe figure out a little bit more what accounts for some of those differences. Uh, I think those are two good good suggestions. Thanks, Mike. Are there any other questions or feedback on the, um, the truck count? Um, and standag data or the other suggested data sets that we're thinking about using. Okay. I think we'll go ahead and this was the last item for us today. Um, so I just want to make sure all of our feedback is collected before we jump into non agenda items or other participant uh, comments. Okay, we'll go ahead and move on then. Um, so if there is any questions or if there are no questions or comments on the agenda, we we like to typically open the floor for any non-agenda comments or you know any other announcements that um, participants may have. Um, if there are any, this would be the time to bring those to our attention. Uh, Yassi. Yeah, hi, good afternoon. This is my first working group meeting, so I want to appreciate all the hard work the team has been um, trucking along in, pun intended. Um, my question is, have you all done an estimate of how many warehouses over 100,000 square feet there are in the region? Or 50,000, like whatever, between 50 to 100 or whatever square footage you are focusing here on? And that's my, I just had a question about that. I don't know if yeah, this is the appropriate time. No, perfect. Yeah, no, I appreciate you bringing that up, Yassi, and thank you for, for joining us today. Um, yes, we, we have been doing, uh, we do have a, a, an estimate that we've been utilizing. Um, and we did a lot of that in, in a lot of that estimation work kind of early on in our warehouse working group process. So I would probably call your uh, call your attention to some of the early presentations that we did, uh, which was kind of a grounding of sorts in terms of the information we've been talking about, probably for the better better part of uh, probably about two years now, uh, in various working group updates as well as some governing board updates going even further than that. Um, so I you know we we I think there are a few slides within those presentations um, to that could provide some better clarity on that. I don't have the exact numbers off offhand in my head right now, but um, I'm certain I'm certain we could probably point you in the direction of the breakdown in terms of um, you know the number of facilities that are at different thresholds. Randy, I don't know if if you uh, have that number at your disposal right now, but do you have any information on that? Yeah, I, I do. I I pulled up our um. But basically, the uh, for hundred thousand and above, we are estimating at two hundred forty three uh, facilities, and between fifty and a hundred thousand square feet, um, we're estimating at four hundred fourteen. So, um, if you're looking at a threshold of fifty thousand and above, you're looking at about six hundred fifty. 
potential warehouses that would be subject. Thanks so much for an estimated number. And then um, I also had another question on the direction of these working groups um, for the future. Or is there like a sunset to this? Um, is there a timeline for going to the board with all the amazing findings you've, you know, prepared here? Um, I guess I'm curious about like the next steps and those are my, that's my last question. Yeah. It's like you're reading, reading with my mind right now. Um, so yeah, it's a great, great question. So I think, um, you know, when we, this original working group was set up, um, it was a set up um, around September of last year and, and it was always envisioned to be about a year's long process. Um, it was meant to get more information about, um, you know, certain directives and information that the, that our board wanted us to look into at that point. And so um, what we're hoping to do is to actually, the, we're, we're, we're thinking this may be the second to last meeting today of the warehouse working group, um, and that our last meeting might be held in um, on Monday, October 7th. Uh, that would be the next regularly scheduled meeting of the working group. Uh, and at that point, we would be hoping to uh, present um, some of the, the the emission analysis that um, Randy and a lot of and some folks in our team have been working on behind the scenes to really look at if we were to proceed with a rulemaking um, for indirect sources for warehouses here, you know, and what what kind of baseline emissions are we thinking uh, are, are are happening here in the region? What kind of possible emission reductions we might be able to get if one if we were to proceed with a rulemaking? And kind of looking at that at really in the perspective of the, some of the information we were talking about today and looking at San Diego specific information, which we really didn't have, um, you know, a year or two ago when we presented some of this information to our governing board uh, back in June of last year and even prior to that. So um, it's kind of an update to a lot of that information um, to be uh, and, and to be able to answer some specific questions that our board directed us to look into as well. So we're, we're hoping to kind of have that be um, the, the majority of our focus at our next meeting in October is to just go through that in, in great detail and, and provide as much information as we can. And then we'd be looking to summarize kind of some other things that we've gone through in the working group to date. Um, and then this is ultimately leading up to going back to either our planning and policy committee or our governing board um, later this year or potentially early next year. Um, we're, we're hoping to present a, a supplement to our ISR framework document, which was which is also on our warehouse working group website. Um, this was the document that we presented to the governing board back in June. Uh, to get their feedback, um, we were we were planning to supplement that document with the information that we've learned and covered in this great working group over the last year, and summarizing the some of the information that we've learned, um, going through some of the analysis that we're going to be talking about in October, and really kind of collecting that all to um, you know kind of put a sunset on this working group, and then have our board. Um, direct us to where we want to proceed on this, either a regulatory approach, um, a non-regulatory approach, or, or something in the middle, or both. You know, that's kind of where this is going uh, moving forward. In terms of timing, we're not. it's still a little uncertain in terms of if we'd be going to the board uh, in November or potentially early next year um, with that. But we do. one thing that's clear is we do want to give um, you know, the participants in this working group, as well as other stakeholders, the opportunity to review that document, that supplement document with, that we're working on behind the scenes. Um, we want to, to give everybody an opportunity to review that information prior to the board seeing it, as well as giving the board itself the time to review it um, and consider other options. So um, that's kind of where we're going um, in a nutshell right there. Hopefully that's that's useful information. Yeah, thanks, Yassi. And then, um, let's see. I see, just to cover a quick comment from Andrew, I see in the chat, I must have missed this, is that the GoBiz data tool gives a good idea of the number of transportation warehousing establishments 
there are in San Diego County. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Thanks for bringing that to our attention. Okay, um, so is there um, any other non-feed, uh, other questions or agenda topics? Um, other information we wanted to bring to our attention? Uh, we did want, if there isn't, um, I did just want to remind everybody before we leave that um, notifications for this working group are sent to those that are subscribed on our warehouse working group email listserv. Um, those are sent usually on the Thursday or Friday before the meeting. So um, uh, if you haven't signed up for that listserv already, please do so by um, going to the link that um, Kathy sent uh, up to the warehouse working group website, get signed up for that, and then um, sign up for our email listserv that's on there and you can get notified of the agenda materials on that Thursday or Friday before the next meeting. All right, with that, I think we'll go ahead and um, finish off here. Uh, the next slide is just our contact information for me and Randy. Um, again, welcome to reach out to us with any questions or comments and we'll go ahead and conclude today's presentation. So thank you everyone for the great feedback today and we'll see you in early October. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Take care.